Uh, from my point of view, I'm not very familiar now with hip and pelvis in particular, but I enjoyed really to remind here some uh, operations, some procedures that some people forgot, in particular. Uh, I think, in my opinion, and I was teach it that the best hip prosthesis is the head of the femur. And if we can preserve the head of the femur, I think that a, a good gain. Uh, my question is related more uh, with the, the new uh, prosthesis in particular. Where is the place of the uh, articular bearing uh, uh, ceramic ceramic? When do you use, because uh, I didn't mention, I didn't hear to mention the ceramic. There is any place to the ceramic today? Awesome. Thanks very much for all the speakers. So, so b before, before we let them answer your question, there is a talk in the next session on uh, bearing surfaces, but let's just, why don't we quickly go down the panel. Ceramic is now incredibly popular and on the rise. Maybe, M Matt, do you, want to, uh, do you want to kick off with? Uh... Yeah, so my preferred bearing right now is uh, ceramic and highly crossing polyethylene. I think, uh, maybe Craig can comment on it, I think that's becoming more popular in North America in 2014. Carsten in, in Germany. Uh, I have to start with my disclosure <laughs> because I've got some money from Sarah. So you, you have a ceramic so, heart. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we use it for the very young patients. They are really active, means uh, patients younger than 45, 50 years old, like you, of course, uh, because that, that's the people where I think there's, there's a minimal risk of fracture, but that's. These, these are patients where I can accept this risk in relation to the low wear, so that's for me the choice, and we use it more and more. But perhaps that's my personal experience. Craig, anything to add? No. Yeah, I guess the only thing I would add is, in North America, we've definitely seen ceramic and ceramic decrease. And I think with the success we're seeing with cross-link polyethylene is part of that and either the real or perceived risks of ceramic bearings. You know, in theory, they make all the sense in the world. But in practice, most of the data from North America and the registries show that, that they have a slightly higher risk of revision than a, a cross-link polyethylene bearing. So I, I do the same for very young patients, you know, where I, I'm hoping that bearing lasts longer than the patient does, patients in their 20s, 30s, even 40s. Um, I think it makes sense. I guess the only other thing I'd add is uh, you do need to be careful with the liners because the, the, the fractures that we've seen seem to have switched from the head to the liner. So that's just one thing you need to be really careful with if you do use ceramics. I mean, it's worth adding from the perspective of my presentation, I may have spoken too quickly at the end. I, I, th I think the key thing we haven't resolved yet is getting the position absolutely perfect for that patient. And when we do that and can do that, then it'll reopen the, the place for these hard on hard bearings because the, the potential then is massive because we could have a hip for life. It would be fantastic. Question at the back. Well, thanks, uh, first of all, for the great symposium. It's very nice. Uh, my question to Hamy about the subtrochanteric osteotomy. You did mention uh, trying to avoid the medialization of the shaft or sometimes being called the humeralization. Uh, have you, do you have any experience with using the single angle plate, the single angle 130 plate? Uh, we've published one in injury relating to that, and it helps bring the shaft laterally. No, I, I almost used the traditional 120 degree double angle plate, but uh, if you do the plate with a longer uh, chisel, then you can uh, lateralize a little bit the, the shaft in order to avoid medialization. Because that, was of the, that is one of the criticisms that you receive from some colleagues that uh, osteotomies may end up in a difficult total hip later on. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. If you medialize too much in your valgus osteotomy, then it will be a difficult total hip. But we learned that we should uh, correct this during the operation and be more lateral with the shaft. Uh, as said, you can do it using a longer uh, blade, and then you can have your shaft a little bit more lateralized. And you can calculate with the templates. But I have no experience with the 130 degree, you said? Single angle. Yeah. No, no, I have no experience. But thank you for the tip. <laughs> Next time, 
I'll, I'll make a try. Thanks. Dr. Kojima. Yes, I think the plate is part of the planning, but also you have to do a good planning of the, how you're going to cut, how you're going to do the osteotomy. If you just take a single wedge, then you end up with the medialization of the shaft. So you have to plan carefully not to have the medialization. So it's not just the plate. I think it's also the, how are you going to cut the bone. Thank you. Yes, I want to ask about a few technical points. Uh, when placing the cup cementless type, and you did the reaming, and you took the size, proper size, and you want to press fit the cementless cup or shell, and you found it it is a bit uh, loose, would you, it be enough just to put screws? Or would you change the cup? Or would you uh, s cement the uncemented uh, shell? OK, well, let's, let's let Craig take that first. Great, great question. And uh, I would tell you the first thing not to do is hit it harder. And I think many people, that's their first instinct, is to hit it harder. And if you hit it harder, you know, you can break the pelvis, and that becomes a whole different ball of wax. You know, my perspective on it is George Galante and the HG1 that was done at Rush for many years, all of those cups were reamed line to line with screws. Uh, and that's some of the longest data we have with cementless fixation that works. So if I see that situation, I try to position the cup as best I can, and I put screws in, and I think that that's fine. Um, I, I don't, you know, I think the press fit helps because it holds the cup in place for me to get screws in. But I personally, unless I'm using a monoblock dual mobility cup or a monoblock resurfacing cup, I use screws in all of my reconstructions because that's the long-term data that at least we have from our institution. So I would say, don't hit it harder. Put a couple screws in. And as long as you get two good screws in, you should be fine. I think the other thing I would say is always trial. You know, we all do the operations quickly. It doesn't take that long to trial. But remember, the trial is much closer to your final product than the reamer is because reamers get blunt, reamers change. So you have an idea from the trial what's going on before you put the real thing in. And then if, if a cup really is wobbling and you didn't expect it to wobble, pull it out, have a look for the fracture. You better, you know, you may not change. You may just put screws in, but it's nice to know if there's a crack there or not because that may influence how you manage it. You may change. And then uh, just to the tail end of your question before anybody else comments, I would not cement in a cementless cup. If you're going to cement, you need to cement in a cemented cup in, in an appropriate, uh, appropriate configuration. Any other comments? I have a comment, Fair. So one of the most common situations where if you think you've reamed correctly, you've chosen the correct cup, the correct cup design, you put it in and it doesn't stick. It's not because you did the operation wrong, it's because you're either putting the cup in the wrong position or there's some interposed soft tissue. So instead of keep, pull it out, excise the labrum some more, make sure you, there's no interposed soft tissue, make sure you've got the correct version. Because typically you've, you've either over antiverted or under antiverted, and that's why it's not sticking. Reevaluate, regroup, and then use the screws. Sir. Sir. In, in some long standing neglected uh, injury of the proximal femur, we are faced by severe coxavara deformity. Uh, and the, the, uh, last, at last the pelvic tilts and uh, this tilt is, becomes structural in the spine. So when we put these, the stabular component, we do it to the anatomy of the acetabulum, regardless this, the whole position of the abnormally positioned pelvis. What the future of this? What we can solve? How, how can we solve this problem? That's, that's, that's a great question. Who, who's anyone keen on taking that on? So the, the fixed deformity. Uh, in, in relation to uh, hip, you're talking about hip arthroplasty rather than yeah, hip preservation. Uh, hip arthroplasty, yeah. Because the guys would tell you here they'd rather they preserve the hip, they do something clever. <laughs> Is that right? You, you guys would do something really clever and keep the hip. Carsten, so, hmm? Spine, so there you go. So Professor Gann says deal with the spine first. Professor Perker will agree, otherwise, he'll be in trouble. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, any a serious question, guys, because this is a real issue to evaluate. Matt. Yeah, I, I think that's a, great, that's a great question. We've got a series now of 20 patients who had well-functioning total hips, no episodes of instability, and then they had a hip or a, a spine procedure and became recurrent dislocators. So there's no question that's a big bearing. 
Dr. Ranawat, who I did my fellowship with, is still a big advocate of getting x-rays, even in routine patients of the lumbar spine standing to look at this exact issue. I think if you can get the spine taken care of first, that's optimal. That's not always optimal. And at that time, you have to take into account. You can look at how the pelvis is tilted, what the version is, and what the rotation is, and try to accommodate that for that interoperatively. But in reality, until we know dynamically what's happening to these patients outside the operating room, it's hard for you to adjust it in the operating room. And I think the most important thing is what Professor Haddad said, is you have to trial these hips. So even if you put the real cup in, and the real stem in, if you're not happy with it, you need to adjust something. So I think on table trialing is important and then adjusting to what you think is appropriate. Okay, thanks. Carsten? Yep. Um, I, I think one thing helps, and this is, so we, we just fi finished a study with 150 pelvic CT scans, and we have looked for the correlation between the antiversion of the cup and the anterior pelvic plane. And that's what you find is really a clear uh, correlation between both. It means your uh, antiversion of the, uh, of the cup compensates a little bit uh, the, the pelvic plane, so it means uh, you, I, I think my, well, my recommendation is try to put the cup in as described, look for your antiversion, look for your landmarks, and normally it works. And of course, be careful with your approach. And, and speak to the patient about leg length and equality, because those are the cases where... The, might not correct. Hmm? The, the pelvic tilt fi fi finally might not completely correct. And Absolutely. Will accept this. Uh, so you need to be aware of that. Okay. Thank Great you. question. Sir. Yes, just, just one comment regarding the uh, topic fixation versus replacement. Uh, they talk about three factors, the age of the patient, bone quality, and the head, whether it's uh, AVN or But one comment about the age and this magic number and all the literature, I think we should replace it by the level of activity. In one country, 50 is even elder than uh, 70 in the other country, and uh, we should replace this magic number. Okay, so great. So in the, in the modern world, guys, how do we, you know, there must be a th something you can do on an app that tells you whether someone gets a hip replacement or, or a fixation. How, how, how do you really work it out? Because if you can run the length of Copacabana Beach, presumably. A any thoughts? How do you define activity? How would you decide? I think we should avoid this uh, either 65 or 70 or 60 and we should speak about activity and about uh, or if the patient has a purely sedentary life, no exercising, no sports, nothing and he's uh, 60 then he would uh, be like a 70 or 75. I agree completely with, <clears throat> with your statement. It's difficult to, to judge this thing, that activity level. And Matt, you have here. some big databases. How can you tell if someone's going to live 10 years or not? Do, do we have an I mean, do we, in the, in, this is the era of large data. Do we have algorithms? I mean, surely we should have, or something we should be getting, a way of just entering someone's data into a computer and they'll tell us their potential profile for the next 10, 20 years. I know Dan Barry and Kevin Bozik and Craig, you might, I don't know if you're involved in that, have looked at these risk calculators for patients, take into account their chronologic age, their risk factors, comorbidities, and kind of calculating a risk profile. Um, I mean, it's not ready for prime time, but the fact remains that as clinicians, you know for your geography and your population, your culture, if this is a high, high demand patient or low demand patient. And so it's a gestalt, it's an important part of being a clinician is you have the gestalt feeling if this patient is very active, moderately active, or not very active at all. I couldn't agree with you more on the age comment. That was the first thing I said in my slide is, let's get rid of the number because it varies based upon the person that's in front of you and the different area that you practice. Great. I'd like to ask uh, in particular to Professor Gans his indications for uh, combined PAO and femoral osteotomy and if this indication is chosen uh, preoperatively or usually intraoperatively? Yes. Um, in fact, it depends partially on uh, the pre-op evaluation. Um, you know, or you should know, something about the acetabular version, you should know something about the femoral version, then you should know how much you can correct, uh, including the femoral to the acetabular or vice versa, and then you decide 
uh, whether you will go to the FEMO first and then go to the acetabulum. At the end, you have to check what you have. Let's say you are FEMO first. It may be that you decide not to do the acetabulum because it's enough. But uh, more frequently is that you go to the acetabulum as the second part. So every case has to be balanced in uh, using all the different parameters. So it's not, I cannot make an algorithm, I can make an algorithm, but it's too rigid for the individual case. Good question to, to all of you. So we've had a session where we've balanced preservation versus replacement. The, re the results in terms of quality of life of replacement are pretty amazing. When you have a hip replacement, your quality of life will go up. So some of the argument around preservation is that it leaves you with your own anatomy, but the quality of life and the joint outcomes are not quite as high as you get from an arthroplasty. So where do you stop? Because you do some wonderful technological things, but the reality is for the 45-year-old female, it often is much easier not being on crutches for three months, not having a little bit of an ache and just having an arthroplasty. And I know that's a, it's a challenging question, but that's what it's designed for, really, just to see, because some, patients, some surgeons find it much easier to do an arthroplasty than do an osteotomy. Okay. Uh, this is what makes indications. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, primarily, I want to say I hate this discussion to make a competition between the both. One is indicated when you can uh, postpone a prosthesis for a certain time and when the patient agrees with certain limitations of this procedure. Now, the younger the patient is, the more I would um, uh, be in favor for joint uh, preservation and in a 18 year old, I'm happy even if uh, I can postpone the prosthesis for seven or eight years. However, if this patient is 40 and has, has the same parameters, I would say maybe you wait another two years and then we do a prosthesis. So there are so many factors involved that the primary point of your discussion should not be emphasized too much. It's not a competition between the two. Okay. There's a question there at the back. Uh, fracture healing is a, a mechanical and biological problem. Osteotomy solves uh, only mechanical problems. And uh, uh, how many uh, failures did you have, uh, I think, non-unions? Because we uh, heard that 35% of uh, complications was after such operations. And the second question, uh, did you, uh, to the speaker uh, who told about uh, um, osteosynthesis with crossing uh, screws, did you find a, a, a fracture of the screws using this technique? Thank you. Who, who wants to take that? So, I mean, you can, you can all be thinking about the biology. Yeah, there, there's some biomechanical study comparing the DHS and the, the old crossing screw, as you said, and they're mechanically very similar, and clinically they are also similar. So we prefer to use those, but just in vertical type of fracture. We don't use regularly. It's not very common in, in, uh, in elderly patients. It's more common in young patients. So for us, it's the, uh, our primary uh, main of fixation in those vertical type. We haven't so far any uh, problem with the, this type of fixation. So, uh, going back to the age, so I used 65. I, you, you see in all the discussion we, we put, if the patient has 40, and now my patient is obese with 65, so we cannot get rid of aging. What we, it's difficult to define what is your threshold, what is young, who is young, who is not young. But in a certain way, you, you will have to decide. It is a young patient or it's not. And as I said, it's difficult because it's regional based. Sometimes it's like Sao Paulo is different than in the countryside area. So, but we still have to use young and not young. And it's, it's much easier to, 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 
to identify who is not going to leave more than 10. This is easier. Professor Gans. Uh, I was, I was uh, wondering why nobody uh, was talking about the vascularity or the perfusion of the femoral head fragment. Now, age is not the, the prime factor. The prime factor is whether the head is vital or not. Now, we should concentrate uh, on a technique to find out whether the head is alive or not before we make a decision about keeping it or putting it a, a prosthesis. I think we could uh, uh, avoid many mistakes in the age group under 65 and over 65. Very fair comment. I think a very interesting issue for research in the future is uh, how to measure really the vitality of the viability of the head. And it, in some years ago in the AO, there were some studies with laser flowmetry, something like that. Yeah. You still do. Because I think it's important to stop. There are two things, as the colleague really uh, as he said, there are the mechanical factors. So once you put the non-union under, under compression, it will heal most of the times. The problem that you know is uh, what about the, the, the vascular necrosis, which is, in, in my opinion, most of the cases is a partial necrosis and it will take a long time until either it remodels or it collapses. But uh, I think uh, it should be more research to know exactly how the head, how vital the head is to make a decision in a patient that is in a borderline situation between 